Hey there, it's James Taylor here, and I'm delighted today to have my good friend Cyril Cortlieben with us. Cyril is a global speaker and author on creativity and change, a digital nomad who believes in inspiring others, changing mindsets, and in the idea that less is beautiful. He is the author of five books, and when not speaking on stages, you might find him at the Burning Man Festival or climbing up a ladder, as we'll discover in a minute. So first of all, welcome to the, to the show, Cyril. Thank you. Very happy to be here. So share with everyone what's happening in your world just now. What are you up to at the moment? Yeah, at this moment, I'm uh, preparing some new trips. So in uh, September, I'm planning to go to Singapore again. So I'm reaching out to some people and see if I can do some stuff. And probably I got a request to do something in Australia next year. So there I'm also slowly reaching out to some people. I've built up a small network there. So I'm activating those people. And uh, yeah, things are going quite well. And um, obviously you're a, you're a speakers, you member. So you and I were going to work together um, a lot on that. And I'm always really impressed with you because you're, you're one of these speakers who you, you, you take an idea, you learn something, maybe it's a training that I've done or something we've, we've spoken about a coaching piece, and then you go and act. You're very good at actually making stuff happen and, and, and yeah. doing it pretty quickly as well. Is that because the creativity bit in you is it's about adapting to change, being very flexible in that way? Yes, absolutely. And it's, it's, I think even as a speaker, because to be honest, at this moment, my, my business is a little bit slower, which is quite weird because in the previous years, it was really going up. But I've spent a lot of time last year on working on a new book. And then still you notice that, that in terms of acquisition and marketing, you have to stay on top of it. So for that reason, I'm, I'm really open to explore new things. What you see is that more and more speak, uh, speakers get booked via social media, those kind of things. So I, I like to experiment and at least do it, do it for a month, see if it is something for me. If not, if it costs me too much energy or it's not my style, I try to let it go and try something else. So, yeah, I think it has something to do with creativity. Uh, yeah. Experiment, try new things. Uh, but I think that's what you mentioned there about doing the book. I see this, I see this a, a lot with a lot of um, speakers I coach when they go into that book writing thing because it's such a – you know, most speakers I know, when they go into things, they go in like all, you know, really go all in. You like, you get dive and you're learning about your story, yeah. then you're thinking about it and you've got the marketing and the launch. And as a result, there's that period of, you know, the th how many months you're working on that book where you, that's got your focus and you're not focused so much on the yes. marketing and the creative, but you've, you've been speaking professionally now for about five years. Yeah. Uh, but one of the things that you very much position yourself is as an international speaker. A yeah. global speaker. So uh, tell us about that because we're both from pretty small countries. I'm here yes. in Scotland, you're over there in Belgium, and uh, and so there's not lots of opportunities in our own home countries. So, so tell tell me about your thinking when you decide to be a professional speaker. What the international piece was? Yeah, and immediately when I started, immediately wanted to go international. So my website was immediately in English, um, and my focus was indeed. A global focus and that and it sounds really big but like you said you know like Scotland Belgium quite small speaking countries not a lot of speaking opportunities so if you want to make a living of it you immediately have to think in, uh, in a different mindset or framework so that was also for me you know my my English is not perfect but you know I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to go on stage and what I've learned from, and it's also an interesting thing for non-native English speakers. Um, at the last event, it was in Singapore, somebody was sharing a story that apparently most, if, if uh, you think about how many people speak native to native English, and that's only four or five percent. Yeah. I was quite amazed. But if you think about it, it's quite logical because you have a lot of times you have a native speaker talking to non-native people and you have a lot of non-native speakers speaking to non-native English. So I don't think it's, uh, it's a disadvantage. Probably it's even more an advantage because they use quite simple language. 
Uh, I speak a little bit slower, so I don't see it as, as uh, a negative thing. No, I, I, I actually, I definitely think it's an advantage for you, uh, for you mm. because um, I think that was Heather Hansen. I remember her, she did that research yes. about yes, indeed. 95% of all business conversations are happening between people that English isn't their, their mother tongue. Yeah. And uh, a friend of mine, Sylvie De Giusto, based in New York, she's ger a ger uh, German, lives in New York. And she was getting booked all the time on these TV shows. And she finally asked the producer one day, why, you know, I have this funny accent. Uh, why, why are you booking me? And she said, well, the producer said, well, the thing is we love about you is because English isn't your first language, you say things with a certain type of efficiency and a simplicity that works for the, for the audience. In native English speakers, we tend to fl make things a little bit too flowery at times. Yep. And you can go directly. So, you know, whether if anyone's watching this just now, you're in India or wherever you are in the world and you're not a native English speaker and you want to break into the, you know, listen to what Cyril's saying. There's, there's actually an advantage here. Yeah, absolutely. And then once, what, what's quite interesting is uh, what I've done at the start is because how do you get international gigs? So what I've done at the start was looking, okay, what's the most direct way to, to learn something about a country. And one thing is, of course, visit that country. But then how, how do you start to make connections? And I was already a member of, uh, or I think it was the same time when I started my speaking business, I followed an uh, international PSA event, so Professional Speaking Association. And that's that really helped my business because what, what you notice is, a lot of other professional speakers, they gather, and most of the associations, they have one international event once a year. And that's a great opportunity to visit that country at that moment, because then you meet a lot of peers. Uh, since then, I've already got a lot of new friends, speaking friends. You know, we got to know each other. And, and that's a very good start to learn something. Okay, how does the speaking business work in this country? Uh, if you can make a connection, you know, some speakers can see you in action and immediately they can recommend you because they, they already have built up a business in, in that country. So that's also a very good way to start an international business. Uh, but you have to invest some time and money. So you, you, have to, you have to go there. And, buy that uh, plane ticket, get on that plane, go, go there yeah. and spend time. Exactly. You're yeah. absolutely right. Now, you and I both speak on very similar topics. We speak on creativity. Uh, you come out also from the, from the change side as well. Yeah. Uh, we have other people like uh, Frederick Haran, for example, um, yeah. uh, Duncan Wardell in, in the US, uh, people, people like Josh Linkner, for example. Yes. So there's, there's this grouping of probably 10 to uh, Dennis Jacobs in Miami who speak on, on creativity. And I thought it was, in, it was interesting to, to point this out to people that are just coming to the, the speaking industry. We, yeah. Coming in at first, it's a, it's a bit of a strange industry in that we all know each other <laughs> if you speak on your topic. And what is maybe unusual uh, for certain, and not all industries do this. I come from the music industry and this definitely isn't like this in the music industry. Yeah. Uh, we refer work to each other. Yeah. So talk, talk to us about that, about this idea of, of having this grouping of people that all speak on pretty similar topics and how you, how you connect with them, how you work alongside them, or how you share ideas with, with yeah. supposed comp some supposed competitors. Yeah, yeah, and it looks like the first thing you, you might think, hey, competitors, I'm not going to work or talk to that guy. But, but it's almost the opposite because everybody has his or her own style. There's already one thing. I love to work in a very interactive way. Uh, my story is very simple where you... You know, you make links with more, what are the new technologies, AI, that, that's a different perspective to the, to the same topic. But what's also quite interesting, you know, sometimes I get a request for a gig and one of the, the biggest challenges is always the date. You know, am I still free? Because that's in our business, you are the product. So if there is a conference organized on that date and, and you're not free, okay, I want to make that client also happy. So at that moment, their team or topic is on creativity or change. So then it's perfect. You know, I know you, I've seen you at one of those conferences. I totally trust your, uh, your, your content and your style. So I recommend you and, and you do the same for me. So instead of seeing, and it's true, it's, I think it's quite 
a bizarre thing in, in certain <laughs> industries because most competitors, they are afraid to refer each other. And, uh, but I think it's even the opposite. Yeah. And, and the topic is also so broad, you know, creativity change. You can approach the topic probably from 10 or 20 or, or even more different angles. So it's, it's even kind of an add on. You know, once you've seen you, hey, wait a minute, we can build on this. Cyril will look from this perspective to it, and, and, and it works. Yeah. And I think as well, there's, there's also that, I haven't seen this go in, in, in many topic areas yet, but I think it's, actually, I see a little bit in the social media, people, friends of mine that speak on social media influencers, and for yeah. example, what they do is they essentially crowd round, and their voice, because they're all competitors, but they're all speaking at different things, they're making such a noise together about promoting and sharing each other's content and talking about each other's work all the time, either formally or informally, they have this, net, this network, that the whole topic of then of influencer marketing is going up. And more conferences than are booking people that are talking influencer yeah. marketing because it's just being talked. So I think this is actually the opportunity that we have as speakers, if we think of ourselves less as just as individuals, to be actually to work together yeah. and, and, and to collaborate. And, yeah, uh, and absolutely. Yeah. And I think that in a lot of countries, you know, the speaking industry isn't that big. I think in the U.S. it's quite a big uh, speaking industry. To be honest, I don't do a lot of work there. I've, I spoke there a few times, three, four times, but not, not a lot. Because I think the speaking business is already quite, it's, it's quite busy there. Mm. But then if you compare it with, with other continents, like in Europe, it's, it's, it's okay. But uh, countries like Asia or Australia... You know, they're looking for speakers. And the nice thing, and that's again an advantage, if you are an international speaker, if you're coming from a different country, most of the time, you think, wow, you know, we have an international guest. And then immediately, you know, you go up in, in the ranking instead of being a local speaker. So it's quite funny that I think at one moment I, I had a speaking request for the same company. One was in Belgium. <laughs> One was in Asia, and in Asia, they were really talking, wow, we can get the speaker, and it's really nice. And, and here in Belgium, it was, oh, yeah, okay, we have, we have a Belgian speaker. And I didn't get the Belgian gig, but it did something in Singapore, which is quite crazy. But I think the international aspect probably played a role in that one. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, Manoj Vasudevan, he calls it the alien advantage, that you, you, you know, this, this, <laughs> this foreign thing. And I, I don't think, I know, I know a big part of your strategy has been, obviously speaking globally, but also pushing into Asia a lot. And we, I know you're spending, you spend a lot of time yeah. in Asia, developing in some of those new, new countries in Thailand a lot, for example. Yeah. So tell me, what is your thinking about it as, uh, as Asia? Are there particular countries in Asia that you find particularly exciting at the moment? Uh, for me at this moment, yeah, I'm still building up my business in, uh, in Asia. And then my strategy is to go at least two or three times to the same spot. So now I'm, I'm even thinking about starting a business hub in, uh, in Singapore. Why Singapore? It's so easy. Uh, a lot of headquarters of, of Asia are based there. So if you can do something there, it's a lot easier than to travel around, go to uh, Malaysia, Philippines, uh, Vietnam, those countries around it. So at this moment, I'm mainly focusing on uh, Singapore, Hong Kong. Uh, what I'm noticing is that there is still quite a lot of uh, focus on the training, master classes. But that could be a good start. I'm noticing that you're more and more open to have a kind of a keynote for a larger group and then do a master class or do a training of half a day or a day for a smaller group uh, of people. But I have a feeling that, that, that it's really booming. I, I think five years ago, it was the first time that I went there. And then also the, the Asia professional speakers, it was still a smaller group. But in five years, they boomed. They, they yeah. are really doing well. And, uh, and I have a feeling that you're more and more open for uh, also the speaking business. So that's one of the reasons why, yeah, I want to be there. And I like it. I like the people. We, we love Thailand to make combine it with a holiday. So that's also really interesting. Once you're based in a place like that or you have a good network, it's so easy to travel and, and explore that part of the world, you know? So, so talk, talk about that, the, the lifestyle piece, because um, 
So I, I speak 50 times a year. That's my limit. I don't want to speak any more than that. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day. He, he did 163 keynotes last year. Oh. And I, I, that for me, that would just, I just couldn't imagine wanting to speak that much and do that much. For you, how do you, is, is there a certain number of gigs that you want to be doing every year? How do you ensure that you have that, that mix yeah. of lifestyle and also you're doing the kind of speaking that you want to do? Yeah, for me at this moment, I would say that still probably 50% is still in the Benelux because, you know, my, my big network is here. A lot of people uh, know me. But then 50% is a bit, bit all over the place, 20% Europe, 20% Asia, and 10% uh, other places. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, it would be similar. Between 40, 50, 60 speeches, 60 will, will be uh, also for me the maximum. What I try to do is when I have an, a gig internationally, I always try to stay, if it is possible, if you don't have other uh, paid things going on, um, but then to stay at least one or two days longer for a few reasons. One, at least have a half day to walk around, feel the energy of the city, talk to some people, but also have an opportunity to, uh, to speak to some other potential clients. Mm. So once I have a gig, for example, in Hong Kong, what I try to do is uh, see if I can invite my network that I already have there, if there is a speaking bureau or uh, or potential client to invite that person to uh, that speaking gig because that's still the best promotion yeah you know i, I would say that yeah probably 90 percent of my speaking gigs come via somebody who saw me so i'm also happy if i'm going to a new country to do some free speeches or marketing speeches do something for a chamber of commerce do something for a HR leaders network and then I'm really happy to play with my fee because that's a good opportunity for me to that more people can see me so I always try to stay one or two days longer mm -hmm. what I've also done certainly when I went I've been several times to Australia and that's such a big trip from Europe just going over one gig it's it's really hard so normally I planned two or three weeks my wife came with me and we combined it with a holiday. So that's, that's what we do still at this moment, probably twice a year that we combine it with a holiday of a week. Uh, and, do you, do you, and do you have a preference in terms of, let's say you're going and speaking, uh, let's, I'm going to say uh, Bangkok as an example. You, you have yeah. a speaking engagement in Bangkok. Do you have a preference whether you have those extra days, whether you have them before the event or after the event, what's, what's your preference? Yeah, most of, the, if you have a free agenda, I would book it afterwards. Why? Then you're done with the speech and then you can really enjoy, uh, enjoy the holiday. Uh, in some cases, a little bit harder, you know, if you already have some speaking gigs immediately after it. Uh, but then, yeah, the day before, what I've noticed is that the client also likes it to know that you're already in the country, a lot of times you want to have uh, an extra meeting with you. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't book a holiday just, just before the speech. Always have, have one day open for some business things. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the same as you on that. I like having it, my, if I have actually having it after the event so I can yeah. relax. The only exception to that is if it's an industry that I've never spoken at before and it's a three day conference, maybe I'm speaking on the last day. I actually like like the one I actually did this week. Um, I went in the day before because yeah. it was an industry I've never spoken to before. And I was a little bit worried that, you know, do I, do I understand this industry? Do what's yeah. their challenges? And I, I, frankly, I just needed a day to go and talk to some of the exhibitors that were there to talk, to have a dinner the night before with some of their yeah. clients. So I could really internalize that. And then I mentioned that you know, in the keynotes, I'll, I'll use some stories yeah. and things. So, um, yeah. So yeah, so yeah. But, but that kind of talks to that lifestyle piece, which it sounds like it's very important for you. And yeah. as you've been building your speaking career, was there a, a time when you maybe worked on something? It could have been a, a particular speech or you did a marketing thing that you were doing for your speaking and you gave it your heart and your soul, but for whatever reason, it didn't work out like you'd hoped. And more importantly, what was the lesson that you took from that experience? Yeah, maybe if, if one nice story, it's not really marketing or business-wise, but it was more, more content-wise. Uh, 
I think it's, it's a nice story also to share with, with people who are not so experienced. Uh, I could, um, it was in Australia, I think it was in Melbourne, and I could do the opening speech for the Professional Speaking Association in, uh, in Australia, so, which was really cool. We had uh, 180 peers, so also quite exciting. Ooh, will it work? So I really developed my speech on, yeah, it was on the change mindset, but really adapted for uh, the speakers. But they had a small event the evening before, before the real conference uh, would start. And uh, what happened, they had, there was, was also a speaker there who was doing a bit more of some networking exercises. But at one moment, that person did an exercise, and, and maybe you know that exercise, an exercise with yes, but, yes, mm. and. It's one of my main parts of my speech to suspend judgment. And suddenly, I, I had no clue what they were going to do, but they were doing all kinds of networking exercises. And suddenly, let's do the yes, but, yes, and exercise. And I was like, oh, no, that's going to do tomorrow. And, and that's quite an important part of, of, of my presentation. But they did the exercise. And I was like, damn, what, what am I going to do tomorrow? You know, I can't, I can't do the same thing tomorrow. And, and they all... So that night was quite, or that evening, I even I didn't join the networking drink because I was really a bit stressed. What is going to happen? But at one moment, the lesson that I took was Cyril, you know, they invited you here to give the speech. You, you are an experienced speaker. Just relax. So what I did, I took a cold shower. That, that really helped. And then I was thinking, Cyril, you know, this, Stay, stay close to yourself. This happened. Why don't you use it? You know, and, and be be vulnerable and, and, and say what's happening to you at this moment. Because it was quite stressed. I was thinking, oh, how are they going to react? And after I allowed myself to, to get into that, 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 that mindset or a more open mindset, I was thinking, Cyril, you talk about the open mindset, so don't be so stressed. What came up to me is, hey, Cyril, maybe you have to do something funny and, and, and explain what is happening to you right now in, in, you know, in your thoughts. And what I've done, and that was, it was really a switch that I made. Uh, the next day, I explained, hey, people, normally I was planning to do an exercise, yes, but, yes, and, but you know what happened yesterday? And then everybody was already thinking, oh, yeah, who, what would happen if that would happened to me you know such a thing and that's what i've done i've used i created a new slide with my thoughts so like a typewriter you know my 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 words or my thoughts came up into the slide oh no he's using the same exercise and that worked out brilliantly so i explained what happened and then i said i made a switch you know i'm going to do the exercise anyway but i do it in my style from a different perspective and it worked out brilliantly, but it needed to, to bring them in the right context. Yeah. So my advice of my learning would be is, you know, stick to yourself, what's happening to you and, and, and bring that story. You know, your audience, they're also human beings. So if you explain your process and I did it with humor that worked for me, people will appreciate it. And, and yeah, it, 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 it was really at, at work. But sometimes, yeah, things go differently. That happens. Yeah. That's why. I, mean, I mean, we think about it. Uh, it's interesting you shared that story because I think that's a, that's a, so if people become more experienced. That is going to happen to you. It's yep. going to happen. It's going to happen. I know someone the other day, uh, he, he, he says there's one speaker that doesn't speak to him because he, he, he gave a speech and he hadn't, he gave his speech in the morning, let's say, he didn't know this other speaker that was speaking in the afternoon or, or what their speech was about. And one of the key stories he used was one of the key stories that they used in the afternoon. And they came up to him and said, you've come, you've, did, did you do this on purpose? Or something? He hadn't done it on purpose. It was just a, it was just a genuine mistake, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen to you at some point. Yep. But it also leads me to believe that there's actually a little bit of power in that. Well, first of all, there's the reinforcement thing. I'm, I'm guessing that by the end of the left that event, Every no, everyone knows the yes and. Yes. yes. <laughs> knows that. But the other thing is, is more of a personality and, and a tone piece where if we think, let's say I have a lot of books on marketing or leadership, 
And but I might like that book. You might like this book because that author speaks to me. This author speaks to you. And it's not. And it's just these those different voices. Um, but this happened to me. What you just said there. Yeah. Uh, almost happened to me this week. I was speaking at an event, and um, I was uh, I was due to speak at nine thirty in the morning. There was another speaker who was speaking at nine in the morning. He was one of the the sponsors, one of the big sponsors of, of the event. And I always ask if someone's just speaking a little bit before me in the morning one, I, I ask, listen, can you just tell me what, what, this, the, the, yes. what the topic is, what they're speaking about? And they were kind enough, that speaker was kind enough to actually send me his slides. Um, and I actually saw what he was doing. And he actually he mentions something that I, op- I do an opening with. In, and, and I was like, oh, how's this, how's this going to work? Yes. But it was great in him because the person that was speaking first was he comes from that industry and he, he was an engineer so he spoke at he spoke like um not a professional speaker would speak he, he, he spoke in terms of stats yes where i speak in like you and i speak we speak more in stories and and yes. principles and uh so actually it worked out quite well but like you know, it was a it was a bit the night before <laughs> i was i was a little bit <laughs> how's this gonna work yeah so and then it, yeah. it also depends a bit on, on your experience, you know, to make a switch or for, it's the same for me. If I, if I, I always try, if there is a, a full day event and I'm the last speaker, I try to be there the whole day Absolutely. just to, you know, you can make connections. It's nice, but also for these kind of things that I had it before that people were using a different exercise, an interaction exercise. So what I did, I switched my slides. You know, if, if you have a backup, Totally fine, even know it, but sometimes, yeah, you uh, share it. You know, it's it's the elephant in the room. Do something with it. Uh, make it, make make a click or bring it. Hey, I'm going to look from this from this perspective, and, and then it's fine. Then then most people are, are okay with it. Uh, can you know. can you talk to, about a, a speech that you've given? In, you've been doing this profession for five years, but one where you felt like something changed maybe it was in terms you just felt like your topic you were really clicking on your topic what you wanted to speak about or, or where you were go you were going at it or maybe something in terms of your craft your presentation but you just went it was one of those ones you remember and you look back and think that was an important for good or for bad can you maybe talk to one of those key speeches in your life yeah um yeah there was absolutely one i i did i did a speech for the european communication summit which was really cool i think there were 700 communication directors from all over europe uh what i had done in advance was i think a week in advance i sent out to uh five or six people from uh, participants who would be attending that conference. And they had a, a short chat with them, but a few, I had a call with three of them, I had a call with three of them, I had an email conversation. And what I did is I asked them, what's, what's the biggest challenge that you have in, in your industry, in the communication, in your role as a communication director? And what I've done, and I didn't know it would work or not, but I created a kind of a word cloud mm. out of all of the answers uh, that came. And I could make a nice link with, with the topic that he had. What I've noticed is that it really resonated with, with the audience. Even I just talked about it for one minute, but just the fact that I could say, hey, I've been talking to several of you in the audience. Uh, I created a word cloud. What I, what I felt was immediately a connection, a better connection. So since then, for all the a little bit bigger events. I, I try to do it all the time to at least speak to several people in advance and, and create a small word cloud. It's not that much work for you. I learned something about the industry. I can make some better connections. Uh, I could use their words. That was also quite interesting. I would would have used a different word, but yeah. they were always talking about this. Yeah, that was, that was quite quite an interesting insight. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's a great technique. There's, I know there's a not related to speaking, but there's a, it related to more on marketing, book marketing. There is, uh, and I've forgotten his name now, a guy who really teaches about marketing. And he said, what he does is before he ever writes a book, he goes into Amazon and he reviews, goes, gets all of the, uh, test, the testimonials in Amazon for a book. Nice. And, and he just loads them all into some spreadsheet and it creates a word cloud. And then 
he sees uh-huh. which words are biggest. <laughs> Those are the words that he ends up using. So it's not the words that he would maybe even use as an author. Nice. The words that your audience, so you're, that's what you've done. You've used the audience's words, how they, how they uh-huh. relate to their problems, the words that they would use. I, mean, I think uh-huh. it's a really smart thing. And, and I can imagine those 500 people in that audience, as soon as they see that, they're going to go, yeah. that's me. That's yeah. me. He, under, he understands yeah. me as well. So that great, that's a great little tip. So I might use that on my word clouds. Very good suggestion. Yeah. Um, what's the best piece of advice that you've ever received in terms of how to build a speaking business? You've, you've obviously interacted. You mentioned going to all these speakers associations. Obviously, you and I uh, yeah. um, work together as well on Speakers You. But from yeah. all these events you've been to, what's the best piece of advice you've heard? Yeah, and by the way, and it's not that I know you, but, but the speakers, you, wow, what a great source of, of, of inspiration. Because, yeah, I joined beginning of this year and I've been watching a lot of videos. Yeah, so if you want to start out, that's absolutely a good base. Uh, I also, uh, probably you've all maybe already recommended before, but uh, Frederick, Frederick Heron, I think he's really generous with uh, his blogs, building up an, an international uh, speaking business. So that's really good. And I think, yeah, one of the pieces of advice that he shares all of the time, and, and it works, and probably people already have heard it many times, but, but it works. So yeah, let's keep on repeating it, is that the best way to get new speeches is deliver a brilliant speech. And that's, and I'm, I'm noticing more because i think my speech is is good i would give myself an eight i always get eight nine ten on, on the evaluation scores and i would give myself an eight but still i keep on investing and in getting better in storytelling uh stage craft and and sometimes people say but so your speech is already very good why because i think if i can go from an eight to an eight and a half or to a nine i'm quite sure instead of three people who line up after my speech, it will be five people. And, and so keep on, on working on, on the speech. And, and even my speech, it's, it's quite simple. I think it's, it's really good, but every minute, what can be better? What, how can I interact better? Uh, but on, now, the, on, on the speech that you did, the one I saw, what I saw in yeah. Singapore, um, you do something which I, I think is a really bold idea. I, I probably wouldn't do it, which is which also speaks to the difference about we both speak on the same topic, we come at it from completely different standpoints. Yes. But you do something. You do something which is co- uh, using a um, a physical prop, yep. uh, and it's extremely memorable. Uh, uh, and so I, I don't know whether you want to explain what it is because I think it's whether you use something like the thing you do or have some type of physical prop. I, I do think a physical prop is a very powerful thing to do that we can learn from the theater, for example. Yeah, absolutely. So in, in, indeed, in uh, one of my speeches that I do the most, it changed my mindset. I use a ladder and a banana and, and it's a little metaphor and it came from a cartoon, which is quite, quite funny actually, because I saw a cartoon with a banana peel lying on the floor there was uh, the ladder uh, was was over it, and a lot of people were walking over the ladder, and which is really bizarre. At one moment, I was thinking, this is this is exactly the essence what I want to talk about because I want to. For me, a ladder or the metaphor of a ladder are all the inefficient rules, systems, guidelines, ways of working that we've built up in in a lot of companies. You know, and. A lot of those those rules are coming from the past. You know, they've worked in the past, but are they still relevant? I was thinking this metaphor is so simple. So at one moment, I did an experiment. Again, let's, let's, let's try it on stage. And the audience, they, they loved it because it is very visual. You know, you see a guy climbing a ladder. And, and to be honest, since then, I already collected a lot of stories real ladder stories because when i'm traveling i'm not taking my own ladder i've been thinking about it you know really build a suitcase with my own ladder it would would be in terms of branding quite interesting but a lot of times at a conference i couldn't get a ladder or i could get a ladder but i couldn't climb it because they were afraid for safety and what if you fall so i could even use those kind of examples 
they are exactly the point that I want to talk about. So it, it gave me a lot of new stories, but indeed, sometimes it's a little bit challenging to, to, to find a physical. To be honest, maybe I would recommend a different speaker, not to use a ladder, but to use something a little bit more something, simple. <laughs> something physical. I saw um, a speaker, Tom Lightning, who we both, both know, uh, uh, yes. so he, he has a great one. He actually has a lot of places now you have these microphones inside of uh, yes. soft boxes and he actually got a, some type of gremlin soft yes. little toy and he's put a microphone inside and he's, he's able to throw it around using yeah. this thing, which he's is even using a kind of catapult. That's right. He used the catapult. <laughs> I'm not sure how much longer the catapult will be making because that's a bit of a problem. To go but the little thing that he takes around him. It's a, it's a great yeah. prop. So I think there's a lot of things that we can learn from that world of yeah. about using visual props because it does make you remember i remember you know you know you are the for me in my, still in my head the ladder speaker. and <laughs> yeah. i can remember that, that that yellow ladder as well and that so might be interesting because another prop that i used just quickly i, I used to, the coaster i don't know if you still remember this one it's yeah. you know, from belgium i use you have a red side and a green side but what's so interesting james is that i've seen people three or four years after my speech I come back, they see me, okay, hey, wait a minute, are you Cyril? I'm still, you know, the coaster is still on my desk. I'm thinking, yeah. wow, this is brilliant material, you know? And, and yeah. you have to do something, you know? It has to be part of your presentation. But I think sometimes it can be smart because we're doing a lot of marketing outside. What's the marketing tool that you can use inside? What's, mm. what's the... What's a small thing? What's an easy thing that, that you can gift the audience yeah. to? Uh, and and the, the one I'm about to do, which I learned from a, a comedian recently, having seen a show, uh, uh, is very low tech because obviously we're talking about physical props, but you can also be um, olfactory props as well. So what she has is she has these flyers, which go in all the seats, but before she speaks about mindfulness, she, she sprays yeah. them all with a lavender scent. And, yeah. and part of her speech, she says something along the lines of, so keep that bit of paper that is there. You know, smell that bit of paper just now. Did you notice I put lavender? That's the smell of relaxation. So put that by your desk. And every, anytime you're feeling stressed, just pick that up and smell that and just think oh, of what I've done. Nice. Wonderful little prop. Wonderful little prop. Yeah, it's gonna, you're going to remember. You're going to keep it behind your, beside your desk. So let's talk about the, the speaker kit. Yep. You're traveling all around the world. I'm guessing you have to be really efficient in what you travel with. What's in your speaker bag? What do you? What's in that that bag of tricks that you take on the road with you? Uh, probably the usual stuff. Always my 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 MacBook and and all the connectors. Uh, what I definitely love when I'm traveling is the the headphones. You know the the sign. That's that's certainly in the plane. But also when when I'm traveling, what I'm noticing is that for me it's a little bit easier to you know I'm not at my home office to really think about some, some bigger projects that I want to do. And then the, the headphones definitely work. What I'm doing more and more is making some vlogs. So uh, some videos, I'm experimenting with it, with, with my social media. So now I'm also bringing, uh, what do you call it, uh, the tripods. Mm -hmm. I have a nice tripod that, that I'm uh, using. Uh, yeah, I'm not bringing the ladder, but that's something that you have to keep in mind is in advance, try to arrange a ladder. Yeah. One moment, you even I, bought one. <laughs> and on the, with the camera, are you just using your iPhone or your, your iPhone. Google cam? Yeah. yeah so you re iPhone. really low, low, well, high tech, but very uh, low weight. It's very easy yes. to travel around. Low weight. And I'm using, I, and I've heard, let me see if I can find, uh, where did I put it? After a little... Yeah, I like these. I don't know if you know them, the Lof Heimik. Yes, actually. I, I met with Ju uh, Julie, who is the inventor of this uh, the other week. Some people are not very, really fond of it, but I have to say I'm very happy with it. It, it, it worked for the social media. Uh, so we bring these. They're very small. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's probably the, the most important things that I bring. And if you could recommend one book to our listeners that you found very useful as a speaker, maybe it could be on the craft side or business more generally or the industry, what would that book be? Uh, I still love the book from uh, Dan and Chip Heat. Um, 
I'm thinking about the, the, the stick, the made to stick. Made to stick. I think that's a very, a book with very, it really helped me to simplify my message. So in they, they talk about how you can, why are some messages, do they stick and others not? And they give a very easy framework. And, and, and that really helped me to, to build up my message. And, and I, I still use it as a kind of a checklist. Uh, is it simple? Is there something unexpected? Is it concrete? Is it credible? Is there some emotion in there? And do you have a story? Um, yeah, that's a book marketing wise it also worked for me uh, and I like the book of Frederick certainly if you want to work on a more global level I think his book is very practical with I think 27 tips to become a global speaker I, I, I think I've read it in two hours uh, it's a great yeah. book lots of fantastic ideas and put in there and very all very actionable as well what about yeah. your traveling all the time is there an online is there a mobile app or online tool that you find very useful for being a, a nomadic speaker? Yeah, I have probably the, the, the Evernote, but most people are using it. That's, that's really a handy one. I use uh, Things. Things is my to-do list. Uh, I find it quite, quite easy one that, that I update uh, every day. So those are the two biggest ones that I use. Yeah, not, not really one that, that really sticks out or... A new one yeah I'm, I'm experimenting with with a few now with uh, the videos to get some uh, subtitles yeah. with uh, rev.com I'm, I'm exploring that one and I, I, I love to use Upwork with uh, some freelancers so we have a few freelancers who help me on that one so uh, yeah and let's imagine you woke up tomorrow morning you can choose any city in the world. Sounds like it might, might be Singapore next Maybe time. Singapore. <laughs> and, and you wake up in Singapore and you have to start from scratch though. No one knows you. You know no one. What would you do? How would you restart to get, get your, your speaking business started? Yeah, absolutely. First thing that I would do is uh, pick up my tripod, my iPhone and create a little video. Create a video, me in action, talking about my, uh, my stuff that I do. The second thing that what I would do probably in combination is, is get a free gig as soon as possible. And again, try to film it, get some recommendations. Uh, I think having a good show reel is, is one of the first thing that, that I would start with and then do a lot of free speeches. You know, even as an experienced speaker, I think, yeah, I call them free. It's not really free because I don't like free, but getting business cards, getting recommendations, asking a referral, uh, those kind of things, that would be my marketing thing to, to start up and build up your network. So those are the two things that, that I would do definitely uh, if it would start again. Yeah. Fantastic. And if people want to connect with you, uh, maybe to refer you for a speaking opportunity, they know that you speak on creativity and change. Where's the best place for them to go and do that to learn more about you? Yeah, that's probably my website, which would be CyrilCourtLeven.com. Um, by the way, if you translate court leaving, court means short, leaving means life. So it also claim to your L is a little bit easier. Cyril, just with C Y R I L, uh, Cyril short life.com. Then you also find me. Uh, that's probably the easiest way to find me. You can find a blog, you can find my books and stuff and, uh, feel free to reach out and I'm happy to send you some other stuff. I will. I started my speaking business. Uh, yep. Well, fantastic. Cyril, thanks so much for coming on today, sharing all about uh, your speaker's life and all the, the journey that you have been on. Fantastic story. And I'm looking forward to continue to work together and, and we'll be hopefully sharing a stage together at some point in the future. That would be cool. Likewise. Thanks, James. How would you like to get paid to travel the world to share your message and expertise? How would it feel to get paid $5,000, $10,000 or $25,000 to travel first class and stay in five-star hotels in exotic locations? What I've just described is the lifestyle of international keynote speakers. And you can join me and over 100 of the world's best keynote speakers and speaker trainers as they reveal their secrets to becoming a better speaker and getting booked to travel the world as a professional keynote speaker. And best of all, as it's an online summit, you don't even have to leave home. Plus, it's not going to cost you a single dollar, euro, pound, ruble, peso, or yen if you sign up for the free pass at internationalspeakersummit.com. 
You're going to receive access to never seen before video interviews with over 40 of the world's best keynote speakers. In addition to this, you'll get access to archive interviews from some of last year's summit guests. So in total, you'll be able to watch in-depth interviews with over 100 incredible speakers and speaker trainers. You'll learn how to find a theme for your keynote presentation, how to craft your talk, how to get booked as a speaker, how much to charge, and ways to get paid to speak on stages all over the world. So what are you waiting for? Head over to internationalspeakerssummit.com now.